Okay, Psych 135. This is the lecture, uh, the two lectures for the week of uh, October 9th. I am here in Austin, Texas for the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society conference. And so uh, I'm recording this lecture so you guys can watch it at home. Um, all right, let's get going. So chapter six was all about memory and it was all about uh, encoding. So how do we get things into memory? And chapter seven is about retention and retrieval. So how do you get information out of memory? When is memory retrieval successful? When is it not? And what are the reasons that lie behind that? So first, let's talk about uh, forgetting. So there's the power law of forgetting, first identified um, by Ebbinghaus in his classic experiments, learning nonsense trigrams. Um, I don't know that he necessarily identified that it was a power law, but he definitely provided data that supported this idea. So the power law of forgetting says that um, you once you have an event, um, you forget most of what you're gonna forget pretty quickly. And then what remains, um, it, what's remaining of the memory kind of lasts for a long time. So uh, think about this, like you just went and saw a movie. If your friend asked you about the movie the next day or in the next week, you'd be able to give them a lot of details about that movie. But as time went on, you'd remember the main points, kind of the main big takeaways from that movie. But if it had been a couple of years since you'd seen that movie, you would have forgotten about a lot of the details. That's this idea to, of the power law of forgetting. Um, if you look at the amount of information that's retained here on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we have time. What you see is that you lose a lot of information pretty quickly, and then the rate slows and you lose uh, information a lot more slowly. And like the power law of learning, which would go the opposite direction. So since we're plotting a, a amount retained, it would go kind of up and saturate that way. Um, we're talking about the power law of forgetting. And in both of these cases, you could plot this data. What you do is you'd plot time on a log scale. And if you do that, you end up with this very nice straight line. And as I mentioned before, for whatever reason, scientists love straight lines, makes us feel like we've figured things out. So it looks like forgetting uh, decays as a function of the log of the amount of time that's passed. All right, now let's talk about interference. So interference is um, when something that you uh, know before interferes with learning something new that you need to learn later, or something you learn later interferes with something you used to know. So that those are uh, proactive and retroactive interference. Proactive interference reaches forward in time. Retroactive interference reaches backwards in time. That's how you can remember these two things. So proactive interference is when something you learned earlier interferes with something you learned later. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say that you have a pr procedure for doing something at your job. Um, and uh, you get a new boss and the new boss comes in and tells you that uh, she wants it done a different way. Okay, so now you've got to learn this new procedure and maybe you have a hard time switching over to the new procedure because the old procedure keeps asserting itself in your memory, right? You go to go do this task that was very routine for you and you start to do it in the old way and then you have to remember, oh wait, no, I have this new procedure and so I should do it in the new way, okay? That's an example of proactive interference. The previous learning is reaching forward in time and interfering with your ability to perform later in time. Um, now let's talk about retroactive interference, which is um, when something you learned later prevents you from remembering something you used to know very well in the past. So my example for that is, um, let's say that you have a computer operating system and that you're very familiar with it and uh, then you upgrade to a new operating system and in this new operating system things are different uh, it takes you a little while to adjust um, then after a while you're good at the new operating system so uh, your friend calls you up and says hey i, I need help uh, let's say installing a printer driver or i need to set up a printer and they have the old version of the operating system and you say, yeah, sure, I can help you. I used to use that operating system all the time. And then when you sit down in front of the old operating system, if you have a hard time remembering how to do something, 
then that would be retroactive interference. The new operating system that you learned later in time is interfering with your ability to remember how you used to do something earlier in time. And you start to uh, have a hard time remembering it, even though you used to know it very well. Okay, so that's retroactive interference. Later learning is uh, interfering with your recall of something that you knew earlier. So that's proactive and retroactive interference. And I alluded to this when we did the demo on working memory span. Um, and we, we discussed the serial position effect. So if you recall, that was the demo where I had you try to memorize a whole bunch of uh, two digit numbers. And then uh, I asked you to recall and we, we plotted out the data and people had primacy and recency. Um, so they had a lot of items remembered from the beginning of the list and a lot of items remembered at the end of the list. And the items in the middle were not very well remembered. So one explanation for that is that the items at the beginning of the list were better able to get into long-term memory because you had more time to rehearse them. There was less competition. You had the beginning of the, the start of the slideshow as kind of a, a point in time that you could anchor uh, these memories to. And so that all increased your long-term memory for the beginning of the list. The end of the list, uh, you're able to remember because you had it still stored in short-term memory. So the fact that you're able to recall those items uh, is because they were still in your short-term memory and you could just kind of spit them out. Now, what about the, the stuff in the middle? Well, one explanation is it, it didn't really have good encoding in long-term memory. It was too far, too long ago for it to still be in short-term memory. So both of those reasons were the reason that you were not so good at the middle of the list. Now we have the other explanation, which is the middle of the list suffers from both proactive interference and retroactive interference. That means the, the numbers you learned at the beginning uh, make it harder to learn the numbers in the middle and the numbers that you learned at the end make it hard to remember the numbers in the middle. And so the middle of the list gets both proactive and retroactive interference, whereas the beginning of the list would only get retroactive interference and the end of the list would only get proactive interference. So this is another explanation for why the serial position effects had items in the middle of the list that were not as well learned because you have interference, two sources of interference, whereas the beginning and the end of the list only have one source of interference. Um, okay, now let's talk about the phenomenon called the fan effect. And it's, it's a form of interference and it's a form of interference in which um, you have too many facts that are associated with a particular concept. And because you have all these kind of random facts, it makes it harder to recall the core concept. So this only works for irrelevant facts. It only, uh, the fan only happens if you have a lot of irrelevant facts associated with a concept in your semantic network. So for instance, um, we teachers run into this all the time because there are all these uh, what we call salacious details um, that we can tell you about a topic. And the salacious details um, are interesting. They get people's interest. Students love this stuff, but it's not relevant to the main point that we're trying to um, teach you. So they end up just distracting from the main content we're trying to communicate. So let me give you an example. Um, early in this course, we talked about John Watson and uh, the rise of behaviorism. He wrote this, uh, this famous article, I think it was in 1913, called Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. Uh, in that article, he set out to define a new style of psychology that was based on the prediction and control of behavior. All right, well, John Watson, uh, talk about salacious details. This guy had all kinds of stuff going on. Um, First of all, he cheated on his wife with his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner. Um, they're the ones, uh, she's the one who helped him do the little Albert experiment. If you've ever heard about that, that's where they, they um, did fear conditioning with a baby and, and showed uh, that the fear conditioning generalized from uh, just a white rat. It generalized to you know, anything that was white and fluffy. Um, John Watson uh, wrote many books about parenting with a kind of behaviorist approach to parenting. Um, however, he turns out he was a horrible parent himself. 
um, had at least one of his children committed suicide. Um, so you see, I'm, I'm giving you some salacious details here, right? Um, but the thing is, those details, while interesting and really able to keep people's attention while you're lecturing, don't actually support the notion that um, he defined behaviorism as the science, uh, psychology as the study of the prediction and control of behavior and all that sort of stuff, right? These are all just salacious details. And if you think about building your semantic network, you have this core couple of nodes where you know about John Watson and all this other sort of stuff, and you have the kind of the main ideas. And if I start hanging all these other things, okay, he cheated on his wife with his graduate student. He wrote uh, parenting books, but he was a terrible parent. He had a child that committed suicide. He um, traumatized that poor Albert uh, and you know all this other stuff. They connect up in your semantic network, those create new nodes, but they're not really supporting the main idea. So they end up um, siphoning off activation that would have gone to those main concepts. This is the idea of the fan effect. You're trying to remember a particular concept, that is you're trying to activate a node in your semantic network. And if you have a lot of irrelevant stuff hanging off that node, then that siphons off the activation that would go into that node. And instead it's being spread out and it fans out and makes it harder to retrieve um, that node. So this only works for kind of um, irrelevant facts. If you have facts that support the main idea, then that increases your ability to recall that concept. But if you have facts that are irrelevant, uh, uh, it doesn't really work. Um, in your book, they have some examples. And I think it was like a, a study where they said like the lawyers in the park and the doctors in the bank and um, somebody else, the construction workers in the park and the lawyer is in the bank or something. And it, it's harder for you to recall, say the lawyers in the bank because bank has two associations and lawyer has two associations. So you're slower to recall that fact because it fans, the activation fans out to these other nodes in your network than you are to recall um, a, a simpler fact like um, the construction worker was in the park because there was only one construction worker in those four sentences and there was there's only one park, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, that's, that's the example from the book. Uh, make sure you understand that. All right, next, let's talk a little bit more about retrieval. So here's the thing about retrieving uh, items from memory. You don't actually, um, you don't actually just purely recall these items. Um, so for example, let me ask you, what did you eat for lunch last Wednesday? Um, okay, that's the question. You're gonna to try to recall what you ate for lunch last Wednesday. If you're like me, what you first thing you did was you said, um, Okay, like what are my what's my class schedule on Wednesdays? Uh, wh where would I have been? What is my schedule on Wednesdays? Okay, that's that's a day I teach from ten thirty to eleven forty five. In my case, so after lunch on eleven forty five, that's about lunchtime. I probably either you know had a lunch I brought from home or went, and, and so I can use these clues to try to help recall this information. Um, and that goes to show that we're not just doing a pure kind of accessing of the memory, we're doing a sort of problem solving when we retrieve information. So one way that we do this problem solving is by using our existing schemas to help us recall facts. So if I said, um, uh, how's your brother doing? Uh, you know, what's going on or something like that. And, and I'm gonna ask you, or I'm trying to remember something about your brother if I know your brother is a mechanic, I might use that knowledge structure and everything I know about mechanics and what they do and their job and all that sort of thing to try to recall facts about your brother. I might use that existing knowledge structure as a way to kind of guide my retrieval. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, so uh, imagine that um, you witness an event, you're an eyewitness to some sort of uh, crime or something like that. Um, and let's say that there were, you, you saw a dog uh, bite another dog at the park, okay? And the, one owner had two dogs. One was a pit bull, uh, one was a lab, and they're accused of their dog biting another dog. 
Well, maybe it was actually the lab, the Labrador that bit the other dog. But since they have a pit bull and we have all these schemas about how dangerous pit bulls are, whether they are or not, I'm, I've met some great pit bulls. Um, but you might falsely recall that the pit bull did the biting instead of the lab doing the biting because your schema, when you go to recall that information later, your schemas about pit bulls that they're more prone to biting uh, might interfere with your ability to remember that the lab did the biting, not the pity. All right, so that, that's my example there. Um, and uh, we also, at the time of encoding, we make inferences. Um, and these inferences are really based on our schemas. So, so the whole message of schemas was that we have these structured knowledge representations. Um, we're constantly making inferences based on the knowledge that we know about the world. That's the idea. And um, at the time of encoding, you tend to make um, inferences. You also make inferences at the time of recall. And it turns out that, th that inferences you make at the time of recall um, are more influential than the inferences you might make at the time of encoding. So for example, let's say that um, you're walking down the street, you look at your neighbor's house, and you see somebody you don't recognize standing kind of right in front of their door. And you kind of glance over and you see that person. And then uh, you think that's weird. And then you look back. And at this point, the person has the door open and they're walking in your friend's house and they shut the door. All right. Uh, you might, re you, you know, you saw them at the, in front of the door, in front of the lock. Then you saw them walking in. And if it turns out later your friend's house was robbed, um, they might say, did you notice anything weird? At that time, you might remember this incident and you might infer that that person picked the lock. You say, I saw somebody picking your lock. Well, you didn't actually. You saw somebody standing in front of the door and then you saw them walking inside. But at, since you're later on influenced by um, the fact that your friend's house was robbed, that might activate thoughts and schemas about how house robberies go. And you might infer that you saw the person picking the lock when in fact you didn't actually see them pick the lock, right? So that's an example of an inference being made at the time of recall um, rather than at the time of encoding. Okay, so next let's talk about plausible retrieval. Uh, this is my this is my symbol here, plausible uh, from Mythbusters and uh, golden retriever here. So that's that's your plausible retrieval. And um, you tend to recall plausible facts as well as facts that you actually studied. So think back to the example with um, the ants ate the sweet jelly in the kitchen on the table and that that whole example. You're developing a, a, a proposition network about this little story about the ants and the, the jelly in the kitchen. And you might recall plausible facts um, as well as the facts that you initially studied. So, so in that demo, you had a hard time recognizing the particular phrase that you saw, but you'd, you remembered the kind of concept. So that's um, like that, that's kind of, um, how you're doing this kind of plausible recall. Um, and the time that it takes you to recall plausible facts decreases as time since study increases. So in other words, um, the longer it's been since you actually encoded that information, the quicker you recall um, plausible facts, not just the facts that you actually saw. Um, so, when you're asking something um, close to time, um, you can remember the particular facts better since you have better access to those memories because you haven't gone through the forgetting curve yet. So you can, um, it takes you longer um, to recall plausible facts and, and you, because you can sort out plausible facts from the actual facts that you studied. But um, later on, as time increases, those plausible interpretations become just as potent and in fact are recalled just as quickly um, the longer it's been since you actually studied. So this is really interesting, right? It means that your memory shifts over time. In the beginning, right when something happened, you can keep track of what did you actually observe and what was an inference that you made. But as time goes on, 
you become less able to dissociate the actual things that you observe from the inferences you made. And in fact, your ability to recall these plausible inferences it, um, decreases over time to so become faster and faster. Um, all right, so I think that that's what we're gonna end here on this slide. I think I've covered everything I need to cover here. Um, but just realize that when you remember something, it's kind of an act of problem solving. So I think the example of what did you eat for lunch last Wednesday is a great one because you, you kind of think back and you reconstruct your day. It's not like you directly access that memory. There's this form of, of problem solving and figuring it out. So like, okay, I know um, my schedule. I know in general, I try to bring my lunch from home. I bet I went back to my office and ate lunch uh, that I had brought from home. Now, what was that, et cetera, okay? So, Recall is often a, an act of problem solving and inference. All right, um, so now let's talk about accessible versus available memories. Um, and this is the idea, I mean, accessible and available, they sound very similar, but um, they refer to differences. It refers to the difference between successfully being able to recall something versus knowing that you know it, but not having it available. So let's talk about the demo we did in class. This is the blocking demo. This is the demo with the presidents and we were able to do it before class ended last week. And in that, uh, in that demo, I, we, just to remind you, we had two groups of people. We asked everybody to recall as many presidents as they could since 1900. For half the people, they had no prompt. They just had a blank sheet of paper and they just wrote down as many presidents as they could remember. For the other half of the people, I gave six president names. It was like Hoover and McKinley and Reagan and some others. And the result, and this happened in both sections of the class, and basically this demo has been working for me for years. I think one time it didn't work, and that was because I ended up with a couple of people who had memorized all the presidents uh, and were able to kind of throw the, the curve. But what happens, and this happens basically every time, the people that I give the memory cues to, the prompts, uh, recall fewer presidents than the people who didn't get the prompts. Even when you take out from the people who had the blank list, even if you mark off the six presidents that they could have in common, uh, or the six presidents that I gave as a cue to the other group, the group that didn't have the cue remembers more presidents besides that. And this happens every time. Why? Well, this is called the phenomenon of blocking. When you're trying to remember something, um, you end up with, if you have certain items that are highly retrievable, for instance, the president names on the list that I provided half the class, those seem to, when you go to mem remember something, those highly available items just keep coming out when, it, when you're trying to retrieve over and over, and they block your ability to recall some of these less available items. Um, in terms of your semantic network, we basically primed a bunch of these nodes to be active, and they kept being recalled instead of um, being able to go and get other things instead. So that's the idea of blocking. And I think uh, I mentioned, <clears throat> this is why if you're trying to recall something or you're asking somebody a question, uh, hey, what was the name of that person we met yesterday? Just pause and let them recall it, don't start throwing names at them to see if they recognize the name. So don't say, was it Bob? Was it Joe? Was it Bill? Was it Jim? That'll just block them from being able to retrieve these, the, the actual memory because you're artificially priming other memories or other concepts and those might actually accidentally block the, the retrieval um, for what you're trying to remember. Um, so next is the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, you probably all experienced it. It's when you know you know a fact, but you, ha you have a hard time accessing it at that moment. Um, so, and, and over here on the right is this little, here's a joke uh, about tip of the tongue. I mean, not the greatest joke, but you know, it's, 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 it's what you get when you go look for comics about the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So the tip of the tongue phenomenon is when you know you know something, but you can't recall it at the moment. Um, and th that's interesting because you both can't recall it, but you also have this meta knowledge that you actually know it. 
And what's interesting about the tip of the tongue phenomenon is that um, people can sometimes know something about the word that they're trying to recall, even if they can't recall it. They might remember the letter it starts with, they might remember something it rhymes with, they might remember the number of syllables, and you've probably all experienced this, um, but they can't remember it uh, exactly. And um, the, the demo for this, if we were in class together, I would ask you some trivia questions. Uh, I, I remember a couple of them. And these trivia questions uh, sometimes induce a tip of the tongue phenomenon where people kind of know that they know, but they can't remember it. So one of the questions was, um, what's the term that means to formally renounce a throne? Uh, uh, the answer is abdicate. Um, Another question was, uh, what do you call the hand in poker when you have five cards of the same suit? So a lot of people might just know that immediately. Some people, uh, it might take a while for them. They sort of know that they know, uh, but they can, can't remember that it's called a flush if you have that. And on and on. So if you've ever experienced a trivia question where you know the an you know you know the answer, but you can't think of it at the moment, then that is a tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, here's a funny story about this. I, I had a student who took this class and she, you know, she learned all these things. And then about a year later after the class, she wrote me an email. She said, I'm trying to remember the name of this and it's killing me. Um, what do you call the phenomenon when something is just on the tip of your tongue and you can't remember it? <laughs> it's just, she wrote me a whole email about this. And I replied and said, uh, that's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So <laughs> you actually, we're saying it in your question, but uh, couldn't recall it at the time. Um, okay, and so the tip of the tongue phenomenon represents the difference between recognition versus recall. So recognition is when you see something and then you see that it, you can tell it's the correct answer. You know it when you see it. Recall is the ability to actually generate the correct answer. And so if you're in the tip of the tongue phenomenon, and you have that kind of um, itchy state in your brain that kind of feels like you just, it's sort of a weird feeling to not be able to recall something. If you happen to see the word written or if somebody says it, you'll recognize it immediately. But obviously you, you couldn't recall it at the time. Um, in terms of tests, um, a multiple choice test is a recognition test. So I give you, I give you a question, hey, what's the name of this term? And then I list four or five terms, A, B, C, D, E. And you have to just recognize the correct term. That's as opposed to say a fill in the blank test or a short answer test, which would be a recall test. And uh, in that case, you've got to actually recall the information and generate the answer. And in general, recall is harder than recognition. Um, recognition is easier because you, you don't actually have to complete the, the retrieval of the information, you just have to sort of see it there and recognize it um, as being there. And this brings us to the next um, distinction that we'll talk about in memory, which is the distinction between remembering versus knowing. And um, the difference, they sound like the same thing, right? Remembering and knowing, but they have a particular connotation in memory research. Remembering implies an episodic memory that you remember the thing happening, um, you, you know it happened, you recall the event, and you recall the circumstances, where you were, who you were with, what time of day, the other aspects of context that were along with the encoding of the event. That is what it means when we say remembering. Um, so that is like an episodic memory tied to a particular event. Knowing, on the other hand, is you know you know the fact, but you don't remember when or where you learned it. So in other words, the knowledge is there, but the context, the contextual information, the episodic information is not present in a knowing memory. So um, you might ask somebody, um, so th they know that they, they report some fact uh, and you say, do you remember that or do you know it? And what you mean is, do you remember learning that or seeing that? Do you, do you have the episodic contextual memory to it? Or is it just something that you know that's somehow in your brain somewhere, uh, but you, you don't actually remember the, context, the context, uh, from when it happened? 
All right, so um, this is a, a theory of memory by Bob and Elizabeth Bjork from UCLA. And uh, I don't think it's in the book. This is, this is new information, uh, but it, it just, it's such a cool theory of memory. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. And it, it really explains a lot of different phenomena. Um, and it's called the new theory of disuse. So um, what do we mean by disuse? You've got some facts that are stored in your brain and you haven't recalled them in a long time and they become less available, right? We, we were call, talking about this like decay, like the, the, the forgetting function, um, things like this. That's what we mean by disuse. You've got something that you remember, you've, you learned, but you haven't accessed it in a while. And Bjork and Bjork present this theory for um, how to think about those kinds of memories. So the first thing is that the theory makes a distinction between stored strength and retrieval strength. Um, stored strength is how well you know a memory, how well it's stored uh, in your brain somewhere, it, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can retrieve it, right? So you, you have one thing, which is how well you've stored a memory. The second thing is how, how well you can retrieve the memory. Um, and that means how, how good is your access to that memory? We all have things that maybe we knew very well at one point in time. Maybe they're a language you took in high school or something, or um, a place you used to live long ago that you haven't visited in a long time. There are memories in your brain somewhere. We know this because if you were to relearn that language or to revisit that location, all kinds of memories would come flooding back. Um, and you'd be faster, for instance, at relearn at relearning a language than you would be at learning it the first time. Okay, the fact that you're faster means that there's there's some memories in there, even though you couldn't necessarily retrieve those memories. Um, so stored strength can be low or high, and retrieval strength can be low or high, and that creates this sort of two by two matrix. So you can have things that are um, poorly stored and uh, have low storage strength and low retrieval strength. Um, so that, that might be something like um, you're, you just, you arrive at a new building and you're going to go visit somebody's office and uh, the receptionist says, okay, it's down there and to the right. And you kind of walk in and you, you go down several hallways and you get to the office. And then when you're done with the meeting, you've got to walk out and you can't remember how you got there. Okay. So that's something that has, poor storage strength and poor retrieval strength. You just encoded the memory. It's not very well encoded and you've only accessed it once. Now, what about something that has poor storage strength but high retrieval strength? That might be something like the hotel room you stay at um, for a few days. So for instance, I'm at a hotel in Austin and I'm in room 313. So uh, all I need to know while I'm here is where to get out of the elevator and how to get to my room. Um, two weeks from now, I'm not going to remember that I was in room 313. Actually, the fact that I'm saying it now in a lecture might mean that I do, but just take the general example. You don't tend to remember the hotel rooms that you stayed in. You kind of have some memory of what they look like or whatever, but if I asked you what was the room number, you don't know it. Yet every time you were staying at that hotel, you could go back and find your room. So that's an example of something you didn't store very deeply, but you used, so the retrieval strength was high, but the storage strength was low. Okay, now let's do another uh, quadrant. So let's say you have, um, let's see, high storage strength, but low retrieval strength. Okay, so these are memories that you used to know very well. Maybe they were the names of your friends and your friend's parents when you were in grade school. And if these are people you haven't seen in a long time, then uh, you may not be able to recall. If I asked you to recall their names, you would not be able to do it because your retrieval strength is low, even though those facts are stored somewhere in your brain. However, if you met up with a friend and you got together and you started reminiscing and provided cues to each other, like, oh yeah, I remember that weird kid who used to eat the, you know, the glue every day in class or whatever. He's now a lawyer, you know, the, these kinds of conversations that you have. Um, you, that will jog your memory and then provide some retrieval. 
um, cues, and then that can help overcome your lack of retrieval strength. And then you'll find out that, oh my gosh, I have all these memories stored that I just wasn't able to access. Another example is when uh, people maybe lived in another state or another country and they left their hometown and they, they only return like 30 years later or something. Um, in that case, they end up with all these memories coming flooding back because the memories were in there, you just couldn't retrieve them because the retrieval strength was low. But the memories were stored very strongly. Uh, it's just that once you go back into the environment, you see all, you have all these contextual cues to retrieval, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. We're going to talk about contextual cueing for retrieval. Um, that that helps increase the re retrieval strength, and then you're able to pull out all these memories that were always in there. They were always stored very well, but you weren't able to access them. And then finally, the final quadrant are things that are high storage strength and high retrieval strength. These are um, facts and things that you know because you use them all the time. So the class, you know, your name is very well stored and highly retrievable. Um, another example is for those of us professors um, who teach the same classes every semester. Man, I, I know my cognitive psychology material really well. I know I know perception material very very well because I. Um, am studying it. It's like taking the same class, you know, eight semesters in a row or something, 20 semesters in a row. Um, I know this stuff very well because I'm, I have a chance to, I, I've stored it very well. It's in there. I've, I've studied it. And then I forget about it for about a semester and then it comes up again and I retrieve this information. So um, the fact that I've allowed there to be some kind of forgetting and then I go back and retrieve that memory, that makes it even stronger. That increases your storage strength. Okay, so storage strength and retrieval strength, two independent concepts. Let's talk about how storage strength works. Um, storage strength is how well something is stored in memory. It only increases over time, it never decreases. And this is kind of a fascinating um, part of this theory. The idea is that if you learn something at some point, it's still in there. It never, it never goes away, um, except that you might lose the ability to retrieve it. So every time a memory is retrieved, however, that bumps up the storage rate. And this, this is based on, um, for instance, studies, I think I mentioned these in class before, where you take two groups of people, they study uh, word list A, and then one group of them studies word list A again, and the other group is given a test on that list. And then you wait and you come back a, a week later and you ask them to recall as many of those items from the list as they can. And what happens is, the people who had the test, where they actually had to retrieve the memories, will remember more of the, the list than people who just studied the thing twice. So this is why I keep saying uh, retrieval is a learning event. And that as you're studying for your classes, it's very, very important to try to um, practice retrieval. Um, this is, if you think about the PQ4R study technique, you read through a section and then you kind of look away and you think, okay, what did I learn in that section? What were the main points? And you try to retrieve those immediately. And that's because practicing retrieval will actually make those memories stronger. It has a bigger increase on storage strength than reading the material again. Retrieval is a learning event and it increases your storage strength a lot. Okay, so that's storage strength. Retrieval strength, um, that is how accessible a memory is at any given point. And we know that there are times when you can't retrieve things. We just talked about the tip of the tongue phenomenon, for instance. So the thing that's interesting about retrieval strength is the idea is that you kind of have a limited amount of retrieval strength. There's sort of uh, just a limited amount of juice and that uh, retrieval strength is spread across all the items that you need at the moment. Um, so retrieval strength, there's a limited amount and it decays over time. Um, so if you, you, you retrieve something and you, it's very accessible, um, but if you don't retrieve it again, your ability to retrieve it decays over time. And um, so the other thing about it is that the higher the stored strength is on the material, the slower your retrieval strength decays. So um, for example, this is why cramming the night before a test doesn't tend to work very well. Um, 
what happens is you stay up all night, you keep reading all this information and just kind of shove all this stuff into your brain because you know you have to take a test the next day. Um, you feel ready because uh, your retrieval strength is so high. You, it's like, okay, ask me anything. I know it, I got it, I got it. I'm gonna do fine on this test. Well, that's an illusion. Um, it feels like you know it because your retrieval strength is so high, but actually your storage strength is not very high because you just cram this stuff in at the last minute. So if there's anything that interferes with your retrieval, so uh, you uh, go talk to a friend before the test or you get distracted or something, that's going to interfere with your ability to actually recall things on the test. And then furthermore, if you've ever crammed for a test, you know that like, you know, a month later, you can't remember hardly anything. That's because you didn't really increase your storage strength. And you only had high retrieval strength. And that maybe got you through the test, but it's not very good for long-term retention. Um, so every time, you know, retrieval strength interacts with storage strength. Every time you retrieve a memory, it increases its storage strength. How much does it increase it? Well, the harder it is to retrieve, the more you struggle to recall information, the stronger the increase in storage strength when you actually do recall, correctly recall that information. And then of course, because storage strength is higher, then that has a protective factor against retrieval strength and it decays slower. So these two things kind of bounce back and forth and they, they interact. And so what does the new theory of disuse say about, for instance, studying um, for a test? It says things like, you know, for instance, if you say you make a bunch of flashcards for yourself and you uh, are trying to, you know, you're looking at the card and you're trying to remember that fact. If you have a hard time remembering it, just allow yourself to struggle. Don't flip the card over and look at the answer. Because right then what you did was you just short circuited that retrieval process and you robbed yourself of the ability to uh, encode that memory more deeply. Um, you, you lost that one chance you had when you, when you to increase your storage strength because you have a hard time remembering something if you can't remember the flashcard you know what just put it back in the list don't necessarily just look at the answer let yourself struggle and let yourself try to recall it and then if you are able to recall it you can find a way to get that information out and finally recover then that's going to really increase your storage strength and you will remember that information much better when it for instance, you, you time comes when you get on the test and you get asked a question about that information, you're going to say, ah, I remember this because I had a hard time remembering it earlier. And so, you know, I, re, I actually re, I have an episodic memory of struggling to remember this and then I remember what the solution was. So that's part of the reason that it, it is such a powerful um, a thing to help improve your, your memory for facts. Um, the other thing is if you're studying with a partner and the person you're, you're asking, you're quizzing them on some concept and the partner doesn't, can't remember the answer, particularly if they're like in a tip of the tongue kind of state where they're like, oh, I know this, but they can't retrieve it at the moment. Don't tell them that will short circuit their retrieval and that will rob them of this chance to increase their storage strength. Instead, give them hints. So say, okay, it starts with the letter M or um, it has several syllables or just whatever hints you can give without actually telling them the answer. Um, those hints, where you kind of support the person and then they're able to successfully retrieve it on their own, that is a huge advantage in studying and you'll be much better at remembering that information later. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave this for now. Um, think about these concepts and, and think about how they work together and then we can always talk about them uh, on Tuesday. All right, next, eyewitness testimony. I've been uh, teasing this out uh, for a little while and um, saying that we're going to talk about some of these implications. So um, first of all, I, I'd like you to go watch these videos. Okay. So, so watch, watch these two videos I have linked here. Um, I'm not going to play them right now because then it's, I'm recording a video inside the video and it probably will be terrible resolution and all that. So go ahead and pause this video, go watch those videos and then come back. And I'm going to have a sip of coffee while you do that. Okay, so Elizabeth Loftus has been working for a long time. Um, she's a professor and I think she's at the University of Washington. And um, she's been showing that people can you can, it's pretty relatively easy to create false memories in people. Um, 
and that this can have a big effect in the legal system. So uh, one of the greatest examples is, um, so down here, you see this graph right here. This is the first experiment I'm going to talk about. Um, this is Loftus and Palmer, 1974. Not me, not nobody related to me, another Palmer. Um, and what happened in this study was um, they had a video of a car accident. And so if you were a participant in this study, you'd come in, you'd watch this video of a car accident. So that means everybody saw the same event and it was exactly the same, which is important. And uh, then after the video is over, uh, I would ask you, okay, describe the event as it happened in your own words. And so you would tell, say everything that happened. So at that point, by the way, you're retrieving that memory which means, as we learned before, that memory is labile. It's open and be able to be changed. Remember the rat studies with the, the electroconvulsive shock and the, all that? Okay, so you recall that memory and then the experimenter is going to ask you a question. You say, well, how fast do you think the car was going when it, and then they're gonna use different words, when it collided, let's see, when it contacted the other car, when it hit the other car, when it bumped the other car, when it collided with the other car, when it smashed the other car. So different um, descriptor words um, for these different things, right? So different verbs de depending and some going from contacted, which is like, oh, they just, they just barely touched each other to smashed has this implication. And what you can see is um, people gave a higher estimate for the speed the car was going depending on the, the word that was used, the verb that was used to describe the event. Um, going from about 32 miles per hour all the way up to about 41 miles per hour. So um, this is amazing because everybody watched the same video. But if somebody questions you about that video later or they question you about event, then the terms that they use can actually reach in and affect your memory of the event such that you will estimate the speed to be higher. So if I'm a lawyer and um, if, if, I'm, if my client had, had a car that was hit by your client's car, I'm gonna interview that witness on the stand and I say, how fast do you think you were going when you smashed into my client's car? Now, if I'm the lawyer from the other side, I'm going to say, how fast were you going when you contacted my, my client's car, right? So uh, if you're a smart lawyer, you're going to use one word or the other to try to subtly bias the, the information that's being reported. Um, so that, that's the, the graph down here from experiment one. Um, in experiment two, they, they followed up with this study and uh, they did the same thing. So participants watched the video of the car accident. They asked them to describe the event in their own words. And then they asked the, the question, how fast were the cars going when they, and they either said hit or smashed. Okay, so how, how fast were they going when they hit each other? How fast were they going when they smashed each other? And again, um, this influenced the people's estimates of the speed. Um, but then what they did, which is really brilliant, and this, this is the difference between experiment one and experiment two, was they sent the people away and then they called them back into the lab a week later. All right, so this is kind of like you witnessed an event and you're going back to the police station to report what you saw. And they asked participants to, um, uh, to describe uh, everything that they saw. And they asked them in particular, was there any broken glass? And what happened was that subjects who were in the smash condition thought they had seen broken glass from the car um, more often than subjects who were in the hit condition. Um, and in fact, there was no broken glass in the video, which is fascinating. So you watched, everybody watched the same video, and then you asked them, how fast were they going when they smashed together? Then I send you off for a week. And because I introduced that word smashed, it gets reconsolidated into that memory. And then you come back in to the lab and I say, okay, was, you know, tell me about the, the accident that you saw. And was there any glass? Well, you've now incorporated the idea of smashed into that memory, it gets reconsolidated, gets put away. A week later, you come back out, you open it up, we retrieve that, we undergo plausible retrieval. That means our schemas influence how we witness things and we remember things. And so that smashed verb is in your schema now. And so then you say, yeah, there was some, there was some glass because smashed implies that 
Earth's glass broke. But in fact, um, they did not see any glass. So that's an example how, of how uh, um, subjects in that condition had their memory changed. They had a false memory implanted of having seen glass when they never actually saw glass. Um, the other classic study that Loftus developed, the classic technique is called the lost in the shopping mall technique. And that's the second video here. And you, you, in that, you see that guy getting interviewed. And um, what happens is in this, this kind of study, um, they, they recruit people, they tell them, we're gonna do this study of um, super long-term memory. So we're gonna ask you about memories from your childhood. And um, so what they do is they, they get information, they contact your family, they ask your family, hey, tell us some questions, you know, tell us some stories from your childhood. And, and the family will write, will write back and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, at their fifth birthday party, we hired a clown and the clown was awesome. And you know, the kids really liked it. And um, there was another time that we went to the Grand Canyon and we rode the burrows down the Grand Canyon to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Okay, and that was, that was a big event that happened when they were eight. Uh, and so you get these actual um, memories and you get all these details. So you bring somebody into the lab and you say, okay, we've talked to your family. They've given us some memories. We know the details from your family members. We're going to see how many details you can recall. And so the, you say, okay, remember that time when you had a birthday party and there was a clown? Can you tell me about that? So, okay, yeah. So I'll recall that. I'll tell you all about everything I can remember from that birthday party. Then they'll say, uh, remember the trip to the Grand Canyon? Can you tell me what you did at the Grand Canyon? You say, oh yeah, we rode the burrows down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. They, they tell them all about that. Then they'll say, do you remember the time when you were six years old and you got lost in the shopping mall? They say, boy, I don't, I don't really remember. And so you, you ask them questions kind of in an interview style to, 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 to quote unquote jog their memory. So they say, do you remember you were lost? They called their name over the loudspeaker, uh, this older gentleman, uh, found you and took you to the desk and, and you say, boy, gosh, I don't really remember that, but um, give it, you're in a very suggestible state because given that you just heard two memories, which you know are true and that you remembered and, and you know, they've been talking to your family, you're suggestible and you think, boy, gosh, I, I just, I somehow, I forgot this shopping mall uh, incident. So they ask you about that and then they send you away for a week or two and then they bring you back and they say, okay, now tell us as much as you can remember about the birthday party with the pony. Tell us as much as you can remember about the um, Grand Canyon. Tell us as much as you can remember about being lost in a shopping mall. And at this point, because a couple of weeks have passed, um, people will recall being lost in the shopping mall as if it's a real memory. They will remember, okay, I was lost. There was this guy, he had on a plaid shirt and he helped me and he held my hand. And I remember them calling my mom's name over the announcement, you know, the speaker, and it was really scary. And they'll, they will invent convincing details about this memory that seem real to them. Uh, and they will not realize that this is not a real memory, that this is an implanted memory by the researchers. And then, of course, the researchers have to go through this debriefing process where they'll say, actually, you never were lost in the mall. We made that up. We implanted this memory in you. And, and, and this can be very distressing for participants if you just find out that somebody has kind of implanted a false memory in your brain. So that's sadly how easy it is to create these false memories. Um, and it's really uh, uh, insidious because you, you don't you, the person, don't have the ability to recognize whether this is a real memory or not. You can't tell the difference because what are you going to compare it to, right? All you have are your own memories. And um, so, so let's, let's talk about how this might affect somebody who's an eyewitness to a, a crime. And let's, let's go on to say how somebody might be falsely accused of a crime that they never committed. It goes something like this. Uh, let's say that you happen to be in a store, maybe you work at the store and it was robbed at gunpoint. Somebody comes in, they point a gun at your face and they rob the store. First of all, if somebody points a gun in your face, there's something called weapon focus where you look at that gun, you don't look at the person uh, because you're very concerned that that gun's gonna go off. So all of your attention, first of all, goes to the gun, not to the person's face. So people have a hard time remembering faces 
if they've been uh, in that situation. But we don't even have to assume that. We can imagine you even got to look at the person's face. So what happens is they, they rob the store, they go away. Um, at some point, a detective will come to the store and interview you. Uh, maybe they found a suspect. Maybe they've got somebody and they think they're the person who robbed the store. So what's going to happen is a police detective is going to come to you. They're going to ask you to look at a photo lineup. So this is, they'll open up a file folder and there'll be six mugshots there of people. And you're supposed to look at those and say, you know, of the six, can you find the guy that um, robbed the store? So for the sake of argument, let's imagine that they got the wrong guy. Okay, so they, they got the wrong guy, his photos in that lineup. And let's also imagine for the sake of argument that um, you pick out of those six, you pick the guy because he probably looks somewhat like the guy who actually did it. Um, you pick the guy who um, they have picked up. So now from the police detective's perspective and from your perspective, they had a suspect, they gave you a choice of six faces, you picked the one that they thought it was gonna be. All right, so they're pretty sure they have the right guy uh, at this point, even though it's the wrong guy. Um, and I also point out that maybe there's a one in six chance that you pick the guy that happened to have in custody. So maybe five out of six times this doesn't happen, but it could happen one sixth of the time. And it might even be more than one sixth because they probably pick somebody who looks pretty close to the description that you gave um, at when the crime was reported. So, so now you've seen this mugshot and you've seen the mugshot more recently than you saw the actual crime. And you are focused on the weapon during the crime. So what happens? When you try to recall that memory of the incident, that memory becomes labile. You see the picture of the, the mugshot. You pick that mugshot and then the detective's like, yes, that's the guy that we have in custody. Now I want you to come down and I want you to do an in-person lineup. Well, what memory of the face are you gonna be relying on? What you're relying on is the most recent thing you've seen, which is the mugshot. And at this point, you're much less under stress. You're not under weapon focus. You have a much better encoding of that face when you're looking at the mugshot than when you saw the actual crime happen. So there's a certain amount of retroactive interference where the newer memory of the mugshot goes in and replaces your memory of what the person looked like during the crime. Okay, so you follow? So now you go into the... To the um, police station and they have all these people in person standing up and you look behind a one-way mirror and you see the guy whose mugshot you just saw and he's not going to look exactly like the mugshot because now you're seeing him in person it's a little bit different but it's going to be close enough and you're going to say that's the guy because you're going to have a very strong feeling of recognition because now your memory of the original event has been replaced by this mugshot so now you, you point, pick him out and they're like, look, she did it again. She found the guy again. This is a good witness. And so now this person's new identity, their new face has now replaced the original face of the original um, uh, criminal. And you've got this innocent person who you're convinced um, has done this crime. So then, you know, six months to a year go by, now you're in court. You get called up as a witness and they say, is the person who did committed that crime here in the room? And you say, yes, it's the defendant over there. And you point at them in a dramatic fashion. And then, okay, yeah, eyewitness saw it. And maybe this person doesn't have a great alibi. And next thing you know, they're convicted. And you don't know the difference. You are utterly convinced that you got the right person. But in fact, you may not have. In fact, this might be a false memory um, because post-event information comes in and changes the way that you see things. Think about the bumped, hit, and collided study. You think you saw glass, there never was glass. You think you saw this person do the robbery, they didn't actually do the robbery. So that's, that's how these false memories can happen. Um, and it's really kind of scary. So um, I keep saying that you, know, you don't know if it's a false memory or not. And the question is, can we tell? Is there anything that we can tell whether something is a false memory or not? And the answer is maybe. Um, so if you do neuroimaging of somebody's brain when they're potentially remembering a false memory, 
you can see a distinction in the processing. Um, so um, let me tell you how these studies go. Um, I'm going to read you a list of words and imagine that this was a, you know, like one of the word studies that we've done where you have to memorize these words and then recall them. So here are the words that you're supposed to remember. Um, thread, pin, eye, sewing, sharp, point, prick, thimble, haystack, thorn, hurt, injection, syringe, cloth, and knitting. Okay, so if I said, all right, recall, and you guys wrote these down, you, you might remember some of these. You might also falsely remember that you heard the word needle. But in fact, I never actually said the word needle. I just said like 10 or 12 words that are highly associated with the word needle. So thinking about your semantic network, I've activated all the nodes around needle and we know they're spreading activation. So the, the concept of needle might get activated above threshold, even though you never actually heard it. And if you wrote down a list of words, you might falsely recall that you heard needle, even though you didn't actually hear it. All right, so that's the paradigm here. Those are called high associates of the word needle. And uh, I can ask you, so put you, listen to these words. I put your brain in a scanner, I'm monitoring your brain. And I say, um, did you hear the word sewing? And that, yes, you did, that's true. You might say, yes, I heard that. I say, did you hear the word needle? And you might falsely say, yeah, I heard that word. Or I might say, did you hear the word door? And you'll say, no, I didn't hear it. No, there was no door. Well, if we look at activation in the brain, um, if you look at the hippocampus, which we've learned is very involved with memory uh, consolidation, it does not show any difference in activity between the true and the false words. That is between hearing sewing versus hearing needle. Sewing was a word you actually heard, needle was one you didn't. The hippocampus doesn't show any difference between those words. However, the parahippocampus, which is closer to the temporal lobe, which is where your, your auditory perception is, that does show a difference between the words that you actually heard and um, these other ones. So um, let's see, the parahippocampus, it's more associated with sensory regions and it did not show elevated activity for false statement. It did not show elevated activity for hearing the word needle. Um, so that might be the way to distinguish between a real memory and a false memory is by concentrating on the sensory qualities of how it sounded when you heard that word, if I was reading these words aloud, or how it looked like, uh, the kind of orthographic properties of the word. If you try to remember the sensory experience of the memory, that can help you to distinguish between a true memory and a false memory, um, at least according to the, the imaging data. All right, contextual effects on memory. Um, first of all, uh, the idea of context has many, many forms. And your context of when you, and where you learn a memory sort of leaks in and becomes part of that memory. Let me give you an example. Um, have you ever maybe listened to a particular album, um, um, you know, a, a music album at a certain time of your life? And you just like one summer, you listen to a certain album all the time, all the time. And then a few years later, whenever you hear that a song from that album, you have these really strong associations with that time in your life. Okay, that's an example of context. Um, it's not just that you remembered the song, that you've heard the song before, it also elements of the context get reinstated. So I hear this song and I think, oh yeah, that was the summer uh, that, you know, whatever. I lived in Boston in this little apartment and it, all of a sudden I'm thinking about this apartment and I think about the kitchen table where we were sitting at. And I remember hearing the song as I was sitting at that kitchen table or whatever it is. So um, that's the idea of context. Um, context, you could think of as kind of little free floating bits of information that are in the environment that get incorporated into your memory and are part of it and can also serve as retrieval cues for that memory. So um, one form of context is your physical location where you actually are. And there's a classic study by Godin and Baddeley, 1975. This is, I think, discussed in the book. They had 
people learn a list of words and then have to try to recall a list of words. And they could either learn the list on land or they could learn the list underwater while they were scuba diving. So they found scuba diving students. And then you could either retrieve the list on land or retrieve the list underwater. Okay, so we have a two by two design on land, underwater for learning, and then on land or underwater for retrieval. And what they found was what if you retrieved in the context that matched where you learned, you tend to remember things better. So if you studied the list underwater, you remembered more items if you recalled the list underwater. And if you studied the list on land, you recalled more items if you recalled the list on land. And um, this is really interesting. It, it shows that if there's a match between your environment and um, your where you encoded, then that turns out to be the best for recall. And this also, interestingly, has some pretty important implications for how we train people to deal with, for instance, scuba emergencies. Like if your oxygen tank you know, runs out or gets clogged or something, you probably want to be instructing people in the water about how to deal with these emergencies, not in a classroom on land, because they're going to be better able to remember it if they learned it in the water and then they're having to recall it in the water than if they learned it on land and they have to try to recall it in the, more, in the water. Another form of context is the time of day. So um, for instance, if you, um, if you took a class at a certain time of day, um, you know, for instance, you say you're in a class that meets in the afternoon and you go to this class uh, all, all semester in the afternoon and then uh, it comes to final exam period and now you have to take an exam at eight in the morning. Um, even though you've been in the same physical location, you're in the same classroom, the fact that you're taking an exam at 8 a.m. instead of, for instance, 2 p.m. when you're used to thinking about that, that will cause you to have poor retrieval because you don't have the time of day as a context that you can help recall it. Um, another form of context is your physiological or emotional state. Um, so for instance, uh, physiological could be anything. It could be um, your level of inebriation. So I, I know people who, uh, for instance, play bar games like pool or darts and uh, they normally play these while they're drinking beer. And if, you, if they try to play sober, they're not as good as they are, for instance, throwing darts or something if they've had a, a couple of beers. And there's actually a psychological explanation for this, which is that your physical state, whether you're tired or you're a little drunk or whatever else it is, is encoded as part of your context when you encode memories. And if you match that context during retrieval, you're going to do better than if you don't have that context matched during retrieval. Um, same thing with emotional state. Um, so maybe you um, were really angry or something um, and, oh, no, no, I got a better example, but much better example. Uh, people who are depressed, who feel sad, have a hard time thinking of anything except for sad memories because their emotional state is such a powerful context and you're better able to recall things from the same context. So this is actually a really big barrier to being depressed. If you're depressed and it's like, oh, I should think happy thoughts, that's actually difficult because um, you have a harder time breaking out of your, your emotional context. It's so highly associated um, with your emotional state. Um, there's also kind of like the physical characteristics of your surroundings. So for instance, they've done studies where um, you learn some, you learn a list in room A, and then you're tested in room B on that list. You're actually not as good as if you learn the list in room A and then you're tested in room A. Um, so those kinds of physical characteristics, um, those are all forms of context. And so um, this all leads you to the concept of encoding specificity. And encoding specificity says that you are um, the probability of recalling an item on a test depends on the, the location in which you encoded that item or the context in which you encoded that item, where the context is the physical location, the time of day, your emotional state, your physical intoxication level maybe, uh, 
any your emotional state, any other physical characteristics of your surroundings. So you're you're best able to recall information in the same environment that you learned it. So um, this leads to certain things. For instance, um, astronauts they're they're preparing to learn. Uh, they're trying to learn how to repair a satellite or something like that. What they do is uh, in Houston, NASA has this gigantic pool that they can use. They do things underwater and that can simulate weightlessness. Um, they get the, the kind of the balance right between the number of weights they put on you and the number of uh, kind of uh, how much floatiness <laughs> your spacesuit has while you're underwater and they get it so you feel weightless. And so people can practice what it's like simulating a space environment. So the idea is that when they're actually in outer space, they'll be better at, at making the repairs to the satellite. So the principle of a coding specificity <clears throat> says that um, if you were to try to study, for instance, for this midterm, um, so I don't know if you're, if you're in the 10.30 a.m. class or the 1.30 p.m. class, but encoding specificity would say, okay, if you're going to study for a test, you should go into this classroom at 1030. So we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you want to come into this class at 1030 or 130. You want to sit in the exact desk that you're going to sit at. You want to wear the same clothes that you're wearing when you're going to take the test. You want to use the same pencil. Um, you want to, if you're going to be, if you get nervous before a test, you want to uh, try to simulate nervousness. So maybe you like go run up and down the stairs a little bit to get your heart rate up. Maybe you drink a bunch of shots of espresso to kind of make you a little bit jumpy. Uh, and you want to try to simulate as closely as possible the conditions of the test when you study for the test. That's what encoding specificity says. And in fact, that leads to the best recall. But you're probably sitting there at home listening to this video going, that sounds crazy. There's no way I could possibly do that. I can't replicate the time. I can't do that. There's probably other classes in that classroom, <clears throat> excuse me, at 1030 and 130, and I'm not going to be able to get in there. And you're correct. <clears throat> it's very, very particular set of circumstances to be able to have that kind, that high level of encoding specificity. So what's the second best thing you could do? The second best thing you could do is to have lots of contexts, lots of physical locations, lots of times of day, lots of different physiological emotional states, lots of different clothing, lots of different everything. Instead of having one consistent context, that you study, which is the exact same context in which you recall, your second best option for recall, and lots and lots of science supports this, is to do the exact opposite, to have as much variation in your context as possible. So what should you do? You should study at home. You should study at the library. You should go to a coffee shop. You should go to a park. You should study inside and outside and in the morning and in the evening and different clothes and all different physiological states and everything else, vary your context as much as possible. And the reason that that works best is because you're going to practice recalling this information because part of what happens when you study is you're, you're doing your good study techniques and you're trying to recall and not just encode. You're gonna practice recalling all this information in lots of different contexts and you're going to develop the meta skill of being able to recall that information in any context. Does that make sense? So you develop that skill. So then when you go into a classroom to take that test in a different time of day, like at 8 a.m. or whatever, you're like, no problem. I, I think about this material at home, at school, in the library, at a coffee shop, at a, you know, wherever I'm studying at my friend's house. I study in lots of different places. I recall this information in lots of different places. It's not a big deal for me to go into another classroom at another time of day and recall that information there. Okay, so that's actually the best thing you can do, which is to widely vary the contexts in which you study. And um, I, part of the reason for that is uh, there's two things. One is I mentioned one, which is you develop the skill of being able to take that knowledge with you wherever you go across lots of contexts. And you can't develop that skill unless you vary context during study. The second thing is those various contexts can serve as a retrieval cue. So you can um, think like, oh yeah, all right, wait, I remember studying this chapter. I was, uh, I was at the Starbucks that day. So I can 
I can perform mental reinstatement. So I can think, okay, what did that, where was I sitting at that Starbucks? What did it look like? I can try to mentally reinstate the context. And then that can help serve as a retrieval cue um, during the test. And so if you have, if everything is, it's like, so you always study at home at your desk, then reinstating context doesn't help that much. It doesn't really, um, distinguish the particular episode of studying versus any other episode that you study. Um, however, if you study in lots of different places, lots of different times, and you can remember, oh yeah, I, I learned this at a particular location, then you can mentally reinstate that context and you won't have as much competition for recalling that information as you would if you uh, only studied in one place. And this is a really important point because if you read a book on study habits, the very first thing they tell you is study at the same time, every day, always at your desk, right? And that's terrible advice from a memory perspective, unless you're gonna take the test at your desk at home at that time, but you're probably not. You're probably gonna go into school and take the test at school or you're gonna do it somewhere else. Um, the best thing you could do is study at lots of different times and lots of different contexts. Um, but what, why is this, so why is the study habits book telling you to do that? Well, they're just trying to get you to study on a regular basis. They're trying to get you to make it part of your routine, part of your schedule. And I agree that studying should just be a routine thing that you do. You're in school. It, you're supposed to spend you know, about as much time outside of class as you do in class studying. Um, I'm just adding in the extra thing of, you know, don't sit in the same place. Maybe sometimes study at your desk. Maybe sometimes study on the couch. Maybe at your friend's house, at a coffee shop or wherever, at the park, the library different places around campus, different classrooms, whenever you can. Just study in lots and lots of different contexts and that will teach you the meta skill of uh, being able to take your knowledge to any new context. And it will also give you lots and lots of cues that you can access through mental reinstatement. All right, so that's, that's what I have to say about encoding specificity. Um, let's talk about transfer appropriate processing. So transfer appropriate processing means Practice the way you're going to be tested. And um, I've already been alluding to this a little bit. Um, so I said, for instance, you've got flashcards and you look at one. Um, and so say they're a flashcard with like the term on one side and the definition on the other, one of those kinds of flashcards. And you read the definition and then you have, you know the term, it's like on the tip of your tongue and you can't remember it. Allow yourself to struggle to recall that information. And ideally you'll be successful. You'll say, oh yeah, it'll finally come to you and you'll remember that term. The reason that that works so well for learning is because that's how you're gonna do on the test. That's what's gonna happen on the test. You're not gonna be able to flip over the card and see what the correct answer is. It's a test. So you wanna do transfer appropriate processing. Practice struggling to retrieve the information so that when you actually do have to re retrieve the information and you do have to struggle, you've practiced that. You've practiced what it's like to persevere through uh, an inability to remember something and you've worked on that skill. That's transfer appropriate processing because that's how things are gonna be on the test. You're not gonna be able to flip over the card and look at the answer. Let me give you another example. Um, this, this is a study um, that involved um, like one of these beanbag toss things like you see here uh, where you have a beanbag. It's kind of like cornhole, if you know that game, and you, you toss the beanbag uh, into the target. So they had two conditions in this study. Um, so first of all, it's one of these studies where you train one day and then you're tested the next day, one of those kinds of studies. So what they did was um, on the day of test, you were gonna stand three feet away from the beanbag toss and you're gonna throw beanbags into the target. All right, that's how you're gonna be tested. So on the first day, one group of people practiced 30, they got 30 practice throws from three feet away. Okay, so they practiced 30 times from three feet away. The other group practiced 10 times from two feet away, 10 times from three feet away, and 10 times from four feet away. So in other words, they got, they didn't just get 30 at three feet, they got 10 at two, three, and four. So let me ask you, who do you think did better on the day, the second day when they had to throw it from three feet? All right, I'll pause for you to, to think about that and come up with a prediction. You might think that the people who had more practice from three feet did better than the people who practiced from two, three, and four feet. 
but they did not. In fact, the opposite happened. The people who practiced from two, three, and four feet did better at the beanbag toss the next day from three feet than the people who practiced at three feet. That seems counterintuitive. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because you had a day off. So you come back in and you're standing at three feet and you have to learn how to judge the distance and adjust your throw accordingly because you haven't warmed up. So the people who practiced at two feet, three feet, and four feet, they had what we call variable encoding, and they learned this meta skill of how to adjust their throw for the distance that they were at. And the people who only practiced from three feet did not learn that skill. So the next day, when they had to do the beanbag toss, the people who had variable encoding at the three different distances ended up doing better because they ended up learning the skill, which is how to judge the distance and adjust their throw accordingly. So um, that is what transfer appropriate processing means. It means practice the way you're gonna be tested, but realize that that might be more subtle than you think. Um, so for instance, how do NBA players practice free throws? A lot of times what happens is before or after practice, they stand at the free throw line and they just shoot free throw after free throw after free throw, and they've got somebody who's there to shag balls for them and throw them back. So they just keep standing at the line and they just keep practicing. That's actually a poor way to practice. That's not how you actually do free throws in a game. That's where performance actually counts is when you're in a game. So really what you should do is you should be running up and down the court um, and then stopping and then standing on the line and practicing the free throw and then run again and stop and practice the free throw. That's how it actually is gonna happen in the game. Furthermore, the beanbag study would suggest maybe you don't just practice exactly at the line, maybe you do a little bit in front of the line, a little bit behind the line and you vary it up, okay? So that's what I mean by practice the right skills. You need to practice how you're going to be tested. And um, you wanna have this kind of variability in your practice. This is why it's better to study in lots of different contexts. Um, that's what allows you to have this kind of transfer appropriate processing. So you're better at doing things um, the way you're actually going to be tested. One last example uh, along these lines. Some of you are thinking about going to graduate school. You might have to take the GRE, or if you're going to law school, you'll have to take the LSAT. If you're going to med school, you'll take the MCAT or whatever the, whatever the test is that you're going to take. How should you practice for that? Well, a lot of people will just study for these tests like, you know, a couple hours at a time, and they'll work through their books and all that sort of thing. But what people don't often do and what is really, really important is to simulate what it's like to take the test. Okay, so this is part of what I mean about practice retrieval as well as storage. Don't just study your vocabulary words. Don't just study your math. Also, get some practice tests. And you can buy these. They sell them. The, the, the Education Testing Service, the ETS, the, uh, publishes old GREs. Okay, you can get those. Or you can get software that has a bunch of previously used questions from the GRE. Uh, sit down close your door, put on a do not disturb sign. Nobody can bother you for like six hours because you have four to six hours. I forget how long these tests last, but simulate the actual environment of what it's gonna be like for you to take that test. Lock the room, practice taking the test. And the reason you need to do that is because there are all these other skills that you learn in addition to just the raw information. You need to learn about, you need to build your stamina, you need to learn about pacing yourself. How long does each section take? What are the strategies you should be doing as you test? There are all kinds of these other meta skills that you need to practice uh, in order to become really good at that test. So practice retrieval as well as storage. Um, we've been talking about that before. Don't just try to read things like if you have, so for instance, if you have the, a little bit of time before a test, are you better off reading the chapter again? No, you're better off kind of glancing at the chapter and then trying to recite all the information you can. In other words, practice retrieval, don't just practice storage. It's really important to practice retrieval. Okay, so let's talk about spacing effects in memory. Um, spacing 
uh, refers to, for instance, masked versus distributed practice. And masked practice is really good for immediate recall. Distributed practice is good for long-term or delayed recall. So um, this is why cramming doesn't work so well before a test. You're much better off if in the weeks coming up to the test, you study a little bit every day um, and you have a chance to um, distribute your practice. And then right before the test, maybe you, you cram for an hour or two, okay? So then you get the benefit of both worlds. You've got good long-term recall from your distributed practice where you've been studying all along, that's great. Then right before the test, you kind of mass information to make sure it's all in your head. And then you kind of take advantage of both long-term memory and short-term memory uh, in terms of it. So why is distributed practice better for, um, for long-term recall? Why does spacing help? Well, it's because you get to experience some things that you're going to experience at the time of the test. So for instance, you get interference. If you study, you know, uh, you have three subjects, A, B, and C, for instance, and you study for A for an hour, and then B for an hour, and then C for an hour. And then if you went back to A, you'd have some interference. You'd have some proactive interference from B and C. They would, you kind of, you studied psychology, and then you studied for your bio class, and then you studied for your math class, and then you come back to psychology, there's gonna be some interference from the bio and math. And you need to overcome that interference in order to recall that information. Forgetting a little bit is good for long-term retention because then if you can succeed at pulling those things out, you see your, your retention, your retrieval strength has gone down a little bit, the storage strength is still there. If you can overcome that lack of retrieval strength and overcome that interference and then recall that information, you're going to remember these things better in the long term than if you didn't have that. Um, also, if you space out uh, your practice, so you practice, you know, you study like an hour a day instead of two hours every day, other day, for instance, well, you've got more retrieval cues. So even if you study in the same location, you are different from day to day. You're wearing different clothes. You have different physiological states. You might be more tired. You might be more happy. You might be more sad, might be more whatever. That gives you different cues that you can use um, to be able to kind of mentally reinstate those cues and help your recall. Um, also, if you space things out, there's a chance for a little bit of forgetting to happen. And if you take advantage of this forgetting, and then when you go back to retrieve information, it's uh, you have to retrieve it, and that, that retrieval is a learning event. So it's best if there's a little bit of forgetting between study sessions so that you can overcome that forgetting and practice that skill of overcoming forgetting. And that's exactly the skill that you're going to need um, when you get to the test. All right. So that's a little bit of why masked versus distributed practice, um, the differences between them and why distributed practice is better. Okay, so here's our, our last slide. And um, this slide shows you um, basically how we modern theories of memory, the different um, forms of memory. And this has kind of been implicit in a lot of things we've been talking about, but I wanted to lay out this whole schematic so you can understand it. So first of all, in terms of long-term memory, the major distinction is between explicit or declarative memories and implicit or non-declarative memories. So you see that here. So Declarative memories, they're the kinds of things you can say out loud, um, whereas implicit memories are the kinds of things you cannot say out loud. So when it comes to declarative memories, there's two types, facts and events. So facts is semantic memory. That's, those are things you know. Events are episodic memories. Those are things you remember. Okay, Remember the remember versus no distinction? So that's declarative memory. And then what are the sorts of memories in the implicit side, the non-declarative side? It's just all this stuff that you can't say out loud. So for instance, motor skill learning, playing a guitar, uh, playing, uh, riding a bicycle, those kinds of things. Those are not very easily declared. They're not easy to say out loud. So let me give you an example. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a question and you just try to think of the first thing that comes to mind, okay? Imagine you're riding a bicycle and the bicycle starts to fall over to the right, you start leaning to the right, which way do you turn the handlebars, to the right or to the left? Okay, answer as quick as possible. 
turns out that now think about like pantomime this. You're riding along, the bike starts to fall to the right. You turn the wheel to the right that helps bring you back up. Um, a lot of people will say that if you're riding and you're falling to the right, you turn the wheel to the left because they think in their heads that that's how you would counteract leaning to the right is by turning to the left. But in fact, that makes things worse. Um, however, if I put you on a bicycle and you started leaning to the right, you would know exactly what to do. Um, the point here I'm trying to make is the skill might be in your brain somewhere. You would know exactly that you had to turn the bar handlebar to the right in order to come back up but it may not be the kind of thing that you can declare out loud. In fact, a lot of things that we know very well, you have to almost observe yourself doing them to, to if somebody asks you how you're doing it. Um, so one example is if you're really good on a computer and you do stuff all the time, somebody's like, hey, how do you uh, change the, the, the print size of the page? And it's like, oh man, I, I can't tell you. I just kind of know where to click. So what you might do is get on your own computer, click, and then observe yourself as you do it and then report out what you're observing. Okay, that's that's kind of how implicit memories work. So priming is a form of implicit memory. When advertisers get their ads in into your brain, that is a form of implicit memory. You can't necessarily state how it's changing your the activation in your semantic network, but it is. And that is a form of implicit learning. Skills and habits we talked about. Uh, cl simple classical conditioning, so like the fear conditioning in those rats that we talked about, um, and non-associative learning, so things like um, habituation and sensitization. Those are all, these are all forms of implicit memory, um, and they are non-declarative. So thinking back to earlier, we had our discussion about HM, the very famous patient who had his uh, hip bilaterally, he had his hippocampus, re hippocampi removed bilaterally in some of his temporal lobe. He lost his ability to form new explicit memories, new declarative memories, but he retained the ability to, to um, form new implicit or non-declarative memories. And that's because those are run by a, a different part of the brain than the declarative memories. Um, the basal ganglia and some of those other associated structures do non-declarative memories where hippocampus and temporal lobe uh, end up doing, sort of laying down your declarative memories. Um, Okay, so that hopefully this recording went fine. I'm going to um, encode it and load it up to YouTube and send you folks the link. Hope you have a wonderful week. And if you have any questions on this material, please feel free to send me an email. I will be answering them in the evenings after the conference. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on um, Tuesday the 17th. We'll have a review session on that day, so please come prepared with your questions. Um, I've already posted the midterm review guide. Make sure you're going through that and you're imposing your own mental organization on those concepts. And please come to class on Tuesday. We'll talk about any questions you have from the Chapter 7 lecture. We'll go over the midterm review sheet and get everybody ready for the midterm. All right, thanks, folks. Have a good week.